And now we will start the next session, Diagnosis of Sepsis, Clinical and Biomarker Challenges. Professor Dr. Adil Ansari, Professor of Anesthesia, Professor of Anesthesia and Intensive Care, Ain Shams University. And my pleasure to invite, to invite Professor Dr. Mustafa Al-Fashawi. To Mustafa, to the chairman. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ala, and uh, all the chairpersons. Uh, I am very delighted to be here with you in uh, the Nutrition and Critical Care Conference of uh, Ministry of Interior or the Police uh, Hospitals. Um, I hope that the next uh, 20 minutes will be fruitful to all of us. Um, I will talk about, or my assignment was uh, to talk about the clinical and biomarker challenges in the diagnosis of sepsis. We all know that sepsis is a major problem that we all have in our critical care units, departments, and hospitals. Um, the, the diagnostic modalities used for treatment, for diagnosis of uh, sepsis are multitude, uh, beginning from history, examination, culturing, uh, recent PCR-based diagnostic modalities, uh, biomarkers, radiology, including bed scanning. We will try to illustrate the clinical difficulties related to sepsis diagnosis, uh, how to evaluate common diagnostic biomarkers. We will enumerate other less common ones and we'll show during the 20 minutes why this is important. The general picture is big. The initial infection is starts anywhere in the body and such as pneumonia, urinary tract, skin subcutaneous tissue or surgical site. Then there is immune system activation followed by inflammatory response and then there's organ damage if this process is not stopped, is not checked. So this ice ball will continue to grow till it can kill the patient. The local infection followed by sepsis. These are the stages, severe sepsis and septic shock. As you can see here, this is a common infection in the ICU, central line site infection, followed by the systemic inflammatory response, which is common not only to infection, but to other diseases. This, these symptoms and signs, and this is the difficulty. This is why it is difficult to, to really diagnose sepsis. Cause fever, uh, tachycardia, tachypnea, and increased white cell count occurs in several diseases and entities. This can be followed by uh, end organ or multi-organ dysfunction in the brain, altered consciousness, confusion, psychosis, in the heart, up to uh, heart failure, in the lungs, ARDS, jaundice, in the liver, oligoanuria, in the kidneys, and coagulation abnormalities. These constitute the SOFA score. Um, after that, you go to into septic shock, and septic shock has a mortality rate ranging from 30 to 80 percent according to the cause and to the comorbid conditions. Again, this is the sequential organ failure assessment score, and as you can see, it does measure the end organ damage led by the sepsis. If the uh, SOFA score is 7 to 9, for example, then the mortality rate would be around 20. If it is 13 to 14, it's 60. If it is above 15, then you go to 80 and 90%. The QSOFA is a modified uh, or rapidly uh, measured uh, score that is used in the ward or the ER to detect patients with sepsis earlier. And this notion has been debated in the last five years, and it's still debated. Uh, however, because these this, uh, three uh, markers only are overestimating the incidence of sepsis. Other scores that can be used include the early warning score, as you can see here. This is a physiological multi-parameter score where the uh, zero level, where the green column is the normal and to the right is the upper abnormal and to the left is the lower abnormal. This early warning score is used initially to detect patients who are at the critical level and then come from the ward to the ICU earlier than 
uh, being more and more critical. However, this uh, score is gaining uh, popularity and is being used also for sepsis diagnosis. The symptoms are non-specific, as we have said before. Uh, the studies, one of the major studies in 2021 by Lopansari in Italy, have shown that 60% of ICU patients receive systemic antimicrobials where the, di the diagnosis is actually a non-infectious disease. The diagnosis of tachycardia, the diagnosis of fever, the diagnosis of tachypnea might be another issue like DVT, like pulmonary embolism, like uh, malignancy-related fever, and uh, so on. So what we can say is that it is maximally an educated guess. Not all patients have really uh, uh, an infectious origin. And this, in this study, was elegantly illustrated where, especially in the respiratory system, uh, only the, 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 the agreement between the, the initial diagnosis and the final diagnosis was 0.3, 0.3, which equals 30%, only 30%, especially in the a respiratory system in the abdominal one, this range is from 40 to 80 percent, uh, as well as the urinary system. So, what we make is actually maximally an educated guess. What is the problem? Is there a problem that we give uh, that we uh, diagnose patients with sepsis more and more? Yes, there is a big problem, and all of us know that. Abuse of antimicrobials lead to antimicrobial resistance, which is a, a global health th threat by the WHO and several other agencies, including surviving sepsis campaigners and others. So giving patients with um, broad spectrum antimicrobials, multi, multiple drugs, without a real indication is a big problem. That's why we have to consider this uh, carefully as much as possible. However, late administration of the proper, the proper antimicrobial leads again to increased mortality. So it's, it's a balance. It's both, both ways can increase mortality. <clears throat> the biomarkers begin by the white BCs, white uh, blood cells, white cell count. We all use it. The predictive ability of the white cell count sensitivity is 52%. Specificity is 52.8%, positive predictive value is 63%, and negative predictive value is 41%. So it is, again, like flipping a coin. It's 50-50. It's, it's never, never, never conclusive. To improve this ability, you should look at the shift to the left, where the sensitivity goes up to 84%, and specificity goes to 71%. This is the maximum, and it, this is in the best uh, labs. Another marker is the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which emerged especially during the COVID era. It is a good marker, but it has confounding uh, factors. This, the, the, these all conditions like age, obesity, use of steroids, uh, sexual hormones, active hematological disorders, HIV, acute MI, stroke, pulmonary embolism, and others, also play a role in the differentiation of this newer marker. So the NLR or neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is a newer good marker, but it can uh, be increased in other situations like cancer, like COVID-19, like cardiovascular disease, and so on. The CRP, we use the CRP uh, extremely, uh, I think, too, too much. Sensitivity is 75%, specificity 67%. If you compare with the initial diagnosis, if you compare with pathogen detection, the sensitivity is only 57%. Cut off, what do you think about the cut off? Should we uh, use a CRP of 6, 12, 20, 100? Rising, declining, what do you think? Who uses 6? Six, as a cutoff for, for initiation of, of uh, antimicrobials. No one. Twelve. No one. One hundred. No one. It is extremely difficult to have the cutoff. When you use a higher cutoff, when you go to the 100, the, this marker becomes more specific. 
but less sensitive. If you use the, the lower cutoff, it becomes more sensitive, but less specific. The only thing is that if it is rising, it is important. And as you will see here, if the marker is, uh, the CRP I mean, is more than 40, especially 40, this might be more, might be more related to a bacterial infection. Higher CRPs are always associated with increased mortality rate, not with the original cause. It, it might not be an infection at all, but it is associated with uh, um, a higher uh, rate of mortality. It is more useful to use multiple checks. However, it, word of caution here, that the uh, CRP is produced by the liver. The uh, half-life of CRP is 11 hours. It does not change daily. It might change every 48 hours if there is something, if there is increasing infection or there is response to the antimicrobial. So it is, it is much more economic to, to check it every 48 hours rather than daily. Um, repeated checks are much more important than single reading. And if the values are more than 40, it is associated with uh, bacterial infection. The other uh, common or popular marker is procalcitonin. Procalcitonin is physiologically undetectable, especially, but in, in special situations, I will tell you. It is produced in extrathyroid tissues in response to cytokines, especially tumor necrosis factor with a sensitivity of 0 0.7 to 0 0.9 and specificity of about 0 0.6. The procalcitonin has a modest discriminatory ability to distinguish between bacterial or, uh, sepsis from non-infectious inflammation. This is true. When you go higher to levels, it, it can be found in immunodeficient host. If the patient has an immune deficiency disease or on immune deficiency drugs, uh, immune suppressing drugs, or in renal failure, the, the procalcitonin might be detectable rather uh, and, and um, non-pathological, non non-pathological rather than physiological. The procalcitonin has reduced sensitivity but increased specificity if used to differentiate between bacterial infection from disease flare in patients with again autoimmune conditions. In COVID disease, if there was no uh, secondary infection, the procalcitonin did not change. And most of the fungal infection also does not change procalcitonin levels. But atypical bacteria usually do not, uh, again, uh, appreciably increase the procalcitonin concentration. So it is less affected by viral infection, by fungal infection, and by atypical bacteria, which resides in, inside the cells. The, if you use a positive uh, cut-off value of 0 0.2, this means might, might mean some infection. If you use two, there is definitely a better chance for uh, occurrence of bacterial infection. Procalcitonin has several, drug, uh, several studies uh, uh, to be used in de-escalation, and uh, um, the use in de-escalation is, is really helpful clinically. I use it personally. Uh, if you compare the baseline procalcitonin level with the procalcitonin level after five or six days from antimicrobial use, uh, if it is declining more than 80% or the absolute value is below 0 0.5 nanogram per milliliter, then you will have the courage, you will have the evidence that you stop or you de-escalate your antimicrobial or antimicrobials, which is uh, a a better practice rather than uh, keeping the antimicrobials as is or to continue multiple antimicrobials. There are multitude of other uh, newer or uh, uh, older uh, biomarkers, including STREM, CD64, Precepsin. CD64 and Precepsin are used in neonatal and uh, uh, pediatric infections much more than the adult. Penta Pentaxin-3, Calprotectin, and SUPAR, all of these have, uh, to my knowledge, no clinical impact till now. There is the academic interest more than uh, 
clinical impact. They are, they are not uh, competitors, real competitors to procalcitonin or CRP. Uh, we just want to, to you, for you to, to know them as, as names only. So the challenges, as you have seen, re regarding these multiple biomarkers, that is, that is, there is no specificity. You cannot take uh, CRP or procalcitonin or white cell count or left to the uh, shift or uh, NLR ratio and say this patient has an absolute infection. There is variable uh, uh, expressions, variable cutoff levels. The, sometimes when you initiate the anti patients, for example, with a, a liver failure, they cannot uh, uh, put uh, out a, a good amount of CRP, so the CRP will be negative. This does not mean that they don't have any infection. Actually, you, uh, also you might have some delayed response. Um, they have some ability to guide therapy, but it is still limited due to the previously stated factors. Any questions? I hope to see you all in our next meeting, inshallah, in November 2024. Thank you very much.